Welcome to the Christian Man Food Podcast. Today we have a sermon by author and pastor Jim Clay of First Christian Church in Walnut Grove, Missouri. He's working his way through 2 Peter and Jude. You can listen to this sermon and others at jphilipclay.com and sign up for our email list where we have offers on free stuff. Thank you for listening. Well, I want to tell you this morning as we're in, again, in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you want to open up your Bible there, I want to tell you as I get started here about probably the most ridiculous thing that I've ever done in my entire life. I lost my keys in my hat. And it wasn't a matter of losing my keys as much as it was a matter of forgetting what I was doing. This was a few years back. We lived at the camp. My son Joel and I We took a load of walnuts one day to the walnut huller down in Miller. You know, it was an autumn Saturday afternoon. We went down there, and right as we arrived at the huller, you know, the machine is humming. You've you've probably, many of you have done this. You've driven up to the machine. You hear that thing humming. Right as we arrived, that machine gave a groan and a squeak and a crack, and then just dead silence, and you just knew the thing was dead. So we're like, well, okay, I guess, you know, maybe they'll fix it. We didn't know, and we had driven a little bit, you know, to get there. So we thought, we'll just wait and see if they can resurrect the beast, you know. So we waited for about an hour, and then after about an hour, this machine with a big shutter, it just came to life again. And we're like, okay, great, you know, we can get in line now to to unload our walnuts. So got ready to move the truck, and I could not find the key. And, you know, we hadn't gone anywhere. We hadn't left. We'd been right there the whole time. And so I started looking all over the place for the key. Now, I had gotten out of the truck and walked around. I looked over every square inch of ground, looked over under the truck, over the truck, in the back of the truck, even looked in where the walnuts were. I mean, I I could not find the dumb key. Did this for so long. I think it was about 30 minutes for looking for the key. In fact, I looked so long that I actually said to Joel, I said, maybe I left the key at home. And he said, Dad, we drove here. I mean, I had even forgotten that, right? So I'm looking for this key, and, and, and finally I, I put my head on the floorboard so I could look underneath the driver's seat again. As I'm coming up, the, the brim of the hat actually bumps up against the seat, and so my hat falls off my head. Now, most people wear their hats on their head, right? And so when my hat fell off, I picked it up, and now my upside-down hat, I looked in it, and my key was in my hat that had been on my head just a minute ago. And I remember Joel and I looking at each other just in this stunned silence of how in the world is that possible? I've been looking for the key for about 40 minutes, and it was literally sitting on my head. And to this day, I cannot tell you how that happened. I can't. I don't. The only thing I could figure is that I took off my hat somehow. I took my keys out of my pocket. I placed my keys in my hat, and I put it back on my head without the key falling out or without me hearing the keys jingle. That's the only thing that I can figure. And I remember being so stunned at how forgetful I could be. And how inattentive I could be. And I remember thinking this. They let people like me drive? That was a a scary thought because I usually have a pretty good short-term memory. Jeanette can attest that I have a very poor long-term memory. I can't remember things that happened a long time ago. But I usually have a pretty good short-term memory. But when I'm not paying attention at all, that information is not stored even in my short-term memory. And the problem is, can any of you relate to this? I can't remember what I've forgotten. That's really the problem for a lot of us. And the scripture here in 2 Peter chapter 1 introduces another theme of Peter's short letter, which is remember. Remember what God has said and remember what God has done. Now, the theme of remembering is really important in the entire Bible. You could go through the entire Old Testament and look at time and time again how the Israelites forgot God. They forgot God, and you see all the the consequences of them forgetting God. And here in this letter, we'll see as we read these verses, that one of Peter's most important reasons to write this letter is to remind Christians 
of what God has said and what God has done. Now, we need to remember what God has said and what God has done. Because, first of all, it's what God has said and done. It's not what some dude a hundred years ago or some guy in the White House or some important person in the world. It's not that kind of thing. We need to remember what God has said and done because it's first and foremost from God. And since it's from God, that's the most important thing that you could know. And yes, we need to remember that. But it's not just that. As we talked about the last few weeks, Remembering what God has said and done is the fuel for living the Christian life. The knowledge of God is the power for Christian living. So if you remember God and you live a life that reflects his righteousness, then you feed faith. But if you forget God and you live a life that feeds your sinful nature, then you're in danger of falling away from faith. And so here, as we're talking about in in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Peter says this. He says, therefore, I always, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Now, the therefore is there to say, because of what I just said, when you come to the therefore in the scripture, you say, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, it's there to say, because of what I just said, the knowledge of God is the power of Christian living. Because of that, I want to remind you. Now, verse 12 is really clear that this letter is written to the Christian, right? And, and I think this is an important thing to understand because there are so many people, and you've probably heard this, I hear, I've heard this, well, you know, I don't really need to go to church, or I don't, I don't need to read the Bible, because I've heard all that stuff before. I've heard all that stuff before, and, and I can't learn anything new. I, I know it all. You know, a know-it-all doesn't really know it all, do they? <laughs> they think they know it all. But the person who says, oh, I've heard all that stuff before, what they really mean is, well, I really don't care about it. See, a person who is the humble Christian And I would submit to you that what a Christian is, is a person who recognizes their own sinfulness and trusts in the righteousness of God to be that righteousness for them. That's what a Christian is, right? Someone who trusts in the righteousness of God. A humble Christian is not going to say, well, you know, all that righteousness of God stuff, I don't really care about that. I don't want to hear anything more about that. No, the humble Christian, every single day, Glenn was talking about this earlier, we are reminded every single day of our own sinfulness, right, brother? We are reminded every single, I don't need any more reminders of my own stupidity and my own forgetfulness and my own sinfulness. What I do need is a constant reminder of God's perfect righteousness. And when that perfect reminder of God's perfect righteousness interacts with my life, then I recognize where I'm at. I compare my life with God, and I realize how desperately I need a Savior. How desperately I need the righteousness of God. So Peter says, I want to remind you, of these godly ways of living. I want to remind you of what God has said and done, even though you already know them, even though you're already established in the truth, I want to remind you. So this morning, as we look at this passage, let's talk about three reasons to remember. Three reasons to remember the the righteousness of God, what God has said and done. The first reason is that forgetters fall, but rememberers remain faithful. Now, I don't know if rememberers is actually a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Forgetters fall, but rememberers remain faithful. Now, let's go back just a few verses here in 2 Peter. Peter has just run through this list of all the excellent moral attributes of God that should be applied in the Christian life. Back in verse 5, he says, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue means God's excellence, God's moral excellence, the perfect righteousness of God. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge. That's the knowledge of God. Verse 6, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And then Peter says in verse 9, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted 
that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Now let's make sure to keep this in its context. This is talking to the Christian. In verse 10, Peter says, If you practice these things, you will never fall. Putting these things together in its context, the Scripture tells us here, falling away from faith is forgetting about the righteousness of God. Now, people forget the passive righteousness that we have because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. They forget how awesome and holy and perfect God is, but also we forget the active righteousness that we should have in everyday Christian life because we want to feed the sinful nature, right? We want to do what we want to do. So we forget God's righteousness and we forget righteous living. So God gives us reminders. Isn't that great that God gives us reminders? See, the reminders come from God. We don't have to make up the reminders. God makes perfect reminders, and we as human beings make terrible reminders about the righteousness of God. Take, for example, the Israelites in the Old Testament. They've been delivered from slavery in Egypt, right? And so, when the Israelites were led out of Egypt, they camp at Mount Sinai. Where God gives the lightning and the thunder and the trumpet call and all this. And God gives Moses tablets of stone inscribed with the finger of God, it says. The Ten Commandments. Here is this perfect reminder of God's perfect righteousness. And there's, there couldn't be any better reminder. God himself inscribed these tablets. This perfect reminder of who God is. Yet what was happening down in the valley below? The Israelites, well, Moses had been gone for quite some time, and they thought, well, I guess he got vaporized or something. We don't know what really happened to Moses. So, so you know what we really need to do? Let's, this is a great idea. Let's make ourselves a reminder about who God is. So they get all their gold and jewelry together, and they go to Aaron, and they say, we want you to make something that looks like God. We want you to make a reminder for us. So he makes a golden calf, right? Now, do you realize what Aaron said when he holds up this golden calf he didn't say hey look at this cool thing I made see that would be considered art (laughs) right no he didn't say that he holds this up and he says this is Jehovah God who delivered you out of Egypt they were trying to make a reminder of God but they made a terrible reminder A very, very fallible reminder that had nothing to do with who God really was. God made a perfect reminder. People made a terrible one. Later on, God established a system of sacrifices. Morning sacrifices, evening sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, monthly sacrifices, yearly sacrifices, special days of the year sacrifices, one day of the year, the day of atonement where the priest would go in and sacrifice into the Holy of Holies for the entire nation, one day, one man, one animal, one sacrifice of blood for all. Why did God do that? To be a reminder says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3, that these sacrifices were there as a reminder of sins every year. Every drop of blood sacrificed was a reminder that sin had a price. And blood was the atonement for that price. And guess what? Since this animal is dying, you don't have to. Every time a drop of blood was sacrificed, it was a reminder of their sin. God made a perfect reminder. But in Jesus' day, the Jewish religious leaders had turned the sacrifices into a complicated money-making scheme for themselves. What God had made perfect, people corrupted. Of course, the Lord himself established the most important reminder of all when he established the Lord's Supper. And we've already talked about this this morning. This is the most important thing that we do every Sunday morning that we're here. The Apostle Paul quoting Jesus. I read this earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When the Lord had given thanks, he broke it. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I said this earlier, I, I want to reemphasize this. This is a living 
memorial. And what we remember and what we receive in this living memorial is so stunning and so amazing that the humble Christian who trusts in the righteousness of God, right? The humble Christian knows he has a desperate need for it. He knows he has a desperate need for it. And I think that this part of what we do in the Christian life, in the church, is such an important thing, and so many people miss it. See, God made a perfect reminder, yet people dismiss it. Who else could make a perfect memorial like juice and bread as the remembrance of the Lord Jesus? I don't get it. I mean, I understand. I, I don't think they're terrible people, but I just don't get churches that don't want to celebrate the Lord's Supper every time they get together. And again, I'm not saying they're terrible, evil people, but I, I just don't understand. I don't understand because really, why go to church at all if you're not expecting for God to be there and to serve you, to do something for you? People go to church because they think that they're doing something for God. You know what? You're going to church does not, does not help God in any way, shape, or form. Only God's perfect righteousness given to you. That's where the benefit happens. We receive the comfort. God does all the work. Isn't that an amazing promise? Martin Luther put it this way. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. He uses the word sacrament, which means mystery, okay? He said, for a person not to prize highly the sacrament. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. For a person not to prize highly the sacrament is tantamount to saying that he has no sin, no flesh, no devil, no world, no death, no danger, no hell. That is to say, he believes in none of these, although he's overwhelmed by them and is the devil's possession twice over. On the other hand, he needs no grace, life, paradise, kingdom of heaven, Christ, God, or any good thing. Surely if he recognized how much evil is in him, and how much he needs all the good things he lacks, he would not neglect the sacrament which gives help against such evil and bestows so much goodness. He will not need to be forced by law to the sacrament, but will himself come running in a hurry to the Lord's table. There's so many people that they think this doesn't matter. The humble Christian who trusts in the righteousness of God will come running in a hurry to every perfect reminder that God gives us. Forgetters fall, but rememberers remain faithful. Now falling, falling away from faith is the worst thing that can happen, but those who forget God are going to struggle greatly to live the Christian life. So there's a second reason Peter gives us here. Forgetters flounder, but rememberers retain the alertness that they need to live the Christian life. Verse 13, Peter says, I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Now there's a, a pause here before we get to verse 14. Let's talk about this stirring up. Peter wants to stir you up, Christian, by way of reminder. The Bible frequently talks about straying away from God as a kind of sleepy forgetfulness. And there's a, an imagery in the Bible, like we could read in, in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about living the Christian life. Wake up, O oh sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. There's a, an imagery in the Bible that those who are awake and alert are spiritually ready to hear God. They're ready to listen to God, to compare their life to God, and live the Christian life. But those who are sleepy, and they're drunk, and they're sluggish, those people are not ready to listen to God. They're too sluggish. Their brain is not awake, right? And this reminds me of several times that I have been coming out of anesthesia, right? And Jeanette could tell you some stories about the really dumb things that I said when I was coming out of anesthesia. And I hated that because I would try to put coherent words together. And every time I'd open my mouth, just the dumbest things would fall out because I couldn't make my brain work. I was so sluggish and sleepy. That's the imagery here. And Peter uses an interesting phrase. He wants to stir you up by way of reminder. What he means there is to wake you up. To stir up is to rattle you, to wake you up. That same word is used in the New Testament 
When Jesus is asleep in the boat, Peter and the disciples are in the boat, Jesus is asleep, and the storm comes up, and they're all freaking out, and what do they do? They wake up Jesus. Well, how do you think they woke up Jesus? <laughs> Little pat on the shoulder. Uh, Jesus, could you please wake up? No, I don't think so. They woke him up. They stirred him. They rattled him so that he would save their hinds, right? They wanted him to do the work because they were so freaked out. They were scared. So they woke him up. Well, it's the same word. Well, Peter uses this word again here at the end of his letter in chapter 3, kind of his bookends. This is the purpose that I'm writing to you. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, this is now the second letter. He's talking about a letter, 1 Peter also, that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Okay, so the question is, why does Peter need to stir up or wake up Christians who are established in their faith in Christ. Well, here's the reason. Because forgetters flounder, while rememberers retain the alertness that the Christian life needs. Now, Peter's going to get into dealing with false teachers in chapter 2. And so I think he's setting the Christian up for that. You're going to have to be alert. You're going to have to be awake to deal with these false teachers. It seems like he's maybe dealing with a false sense of security that a lot of us have. If I can just sit here and sleep and not have to think about anything, then I'll be okay. That's not what Peter wants us to do. He wants to stir you up by way of reminder. I'm waking you up by reminding you of what God has said and what God has done. Now, this is very personal to Peter. It's very personal because he knew that his time was coming and he's burdened as an apostle. He's instructed to feed the Lord's sheep. And so he says there in verse 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And then verse 15, he says, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Now, Peter, as you probably know, he really struggled in his devotion, his discipleship to Jesus Christ. In fact, he flat out failed. He denied Jesus three times when Jesus was tried. He floundered in his faith and he struggled to the point of falling away. But Jesus, in his graceful mercy and compassion on Peter, he restored Peter. But at the same time, Jesus gave Peter a dark promise, a, a prophecy of his own death. This is in John chapter 21, verse 15. I want you to hear this. These, these verses are so important to understand what Peter is saying in his letter. This is John 21, verse 15. This is after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus shares a meal with the disciples, and it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to the Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. When Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The Lord said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And the Lord said to him, tend my sheep. The Lord said to him the third time. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times, right? So the Lord says to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He knew what that meant. Three times of denial, three times of restoration. Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then Jesus said this to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And then John, the writer of the gospel, gives us a parenthetical comment explaining to us what Jesus meant. This is verse 19. John tells us this the Lord said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, the Lord said to Peter, follow me. Now that's really important to understand what Peter's saying here. Here in Peter's letter, 
he makes it very clear that those words were very near and dear to him. Now, Peter is probably writing this letter from Rome very near to his death. Tradition has it that Peter was crucified in Rome under the Emperor Nero after Nero burned Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. And Peter, as one of the leaders of the Christians, was one of the first to go down. Well, tradition has it that Peter was crucified upside down because Peter did not want to be crucified in the same manner as the Lord. It's tradition, but it actually has a pretty good witness. There's some of the early church fathers that verify that Peter was crucified in Rome. We also know from history that, that frequently Roman soldiers would crucify victims, criminals, in various positions on crosses. And so even though it's a tradition, it's a pretty good tradition and especially since Jesus himself says, when you're older, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. And then John tells us, who wrote after this all happened, this Jesus said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. Now, I'm sure that as Peter is thinking about the Lord's hands stretched out on the cross, and nailed to the cross. Realizing that he is in Rome. Where that lunatic Nero rules. Who crucifies people willy nilly. By the dozen. And maybe Peter realized. Exactly what Jesus meant by these ominous words. Jesus point though was very clear. Whatever happens to you. Whatever happens to you. Whatever evil befalls you. Follow me. Follow me. Maybe Peter, more than any other apostle, knew how important it was to remember what Jesus said and to remember what Jesus did. And he wants to remind his readers because those who are sleepy and forgetful can fall away. Peter says, that was me. I fell away. But those who remember are ready to follow Jesus Christ wherever he wants to lead. For Peter, that was literally to a cross. For you, Christian, it's also to a cross. He wants to lead you to the cross of Christ, in which you can submit your life to and trust in the perfect righteousness of God. Peter gives us a third reminder here. Forgetters fumble for answers. But rememberers rely on the testimony of God's witnesses. Now I'm going to introduce here real quickly one of the most important passages in the entire Bible about the authority of the Bible. I'll talk a little bit more about this next week, but I want to introduce it here because it's part of Peter's reminder. Here's a reminder. Everything that you know about what God has said or done, it wasn't invented out of thin air. It was a real thing that happened in time and space. I, Peter the Apostle, I was there. I saw it. I experienced it. I heard it. This is not invented myth or legend. These are the true facts of history that happened in time and space. And so he says in verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I think it's really interesting here of all the things that Peter could have said, I saw. He talks about Jesus transfiguring all the glory of God shining out from the very body of Jesus. Of all the things he could have talked about, the healings, the, the resurrection. This is the thing that was so important to Peter. You maybe you remember the story. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and Jesus transfigures before them, and he becomes white as lightning, glowing the full glory of God, and God speaks. The Father speaks from heaven, and this is what Peter says, verse 17. For when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. That's a great name for God. I love that, majestic glory. And the voice said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. 
the mountain was holy because God was there. Jesus was there and all the glory of God was there. Now, going back to verse 15 real quickly, Peter is saying, I'm writing all this down for you because after I'm gone and I'm going to be gone soon, I want you to remember this. Well, what does he want us to remember? He wants us to remember the perfect God man, the holiness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, the knowledge of God is the power of Christian living. Forgetters fumble for answers. They say, well, I don't know. Jesus was some dude that did some stuff, I guess. Maybe he taught us how to love each other, man, and, you know, be cool. Forgetters fumble for answers. They don't have any answers. They guess. But rememberers rely on the perfect witnesses that God gave us in God's word. Now, as we close here, I want you to consider how important these words are. As with every New Testament book, and, and I get so sick of this, every New Testament book, some Yehu out there says, oh, well, you know, you can't trust that the actual apostle wrote this book. It wasn't the apostle Peter that wrote this. It was some other guy somewhere far away, some dude sitting in his mom's basement on a beanbag, you know, typing. And some guy just somewhere else writing stuff that he didn't have any idea what he was talking about. And so Obviously, Christian, you can't trust the Bible because you don't have any idea who wrote it. That's what we are constantly told over and over and over again. And so if whoever wrote this letter and the rest of the Bible, the rest of the New Testament, if they were just somebody making stuff up, then this book means nothing, right? Nothing at all. And you can toss it out with all the other books in the world that mean nothing. However, if the Apostle Peter, <laughs> the guy who was actually there, and he's actually giving us an eyewitness of what actually happened, and he's actually telling us that Jesus himself is God, and God the Father spoke out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. If that's true, this set of facts about what God has said and done in the Bible is the most important thing that you can know. And everything else in life you can forget about. But you need to remember this. That's how important what, what Peter is saying here. In establishing his eyewitness status, Peter gives us authoritative answers about Jesus' identity. And so this book needs to be remembered. And Peter's point here is don't forget. I want you to remember, Christian, because... The knowledge of God, remembering who God is, is the power of Christian living. It's the power of the Christian life. Now, maybe the exhortation to be reminded about what God has said and done is because God knows how forgetful we are. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I hope that you've never done anything as dumb as I did by losing my keys and my hat. But I bet if we shared some stories, I bet we could all tell of things that we've forgotten if we could only remember them. Remember the Lord Jesus. Remember the righteousness of God and live.